All right, uh, welcome. Uh, and in this video, uh, I want to do a quick uh, introduction to abstract algebra. And while that's going to be the topic of this video, the, the purpose of this video is to, again, just explore uh, a couple different things. One, uh, proof techniques. We've been looking at uh, different types of proof, proofs. Specifically, we looked at informal and formal proofs. We're going to stick with informal proofs here while looking at a couple different kinds of informal proofs. And then the subject matter, since when you're trying to prove something, you need to have some subject matter that you're going to be proving it about. And we've been sticking mostly to uh, logic, set theory, and math thus far. Uh, and we're going to continue that. Abstract algebra uh, is sort of a, a, a generalization uh, of our normal algebra and helps us take a closer look at some of the number systems that we use in mathematics. Uh, and so we're going to explore just an introduction to abstract algebra here, not going too deep into it, uh, just to look at a few definitions and how we can maybe use those definitions in some proofs. All right, so to uh, get started, I'm going to uh, refresh with something we talked about in an earlier video. Uh, let's remind ourselves of a couple different sets of numbers. Here I've got the set of even numbers and the set of odd numbers. Um, we specifically looked at them as uh, natural numbers, but we could also extend that, if you will, uh, to the integers. Um, and then we also looked at these two sets, uh, and we looked at that respect with respect to a certain operator. The operator in question here is the multiplication operator. And we said to ourselves, well, what happens if we take uh, an element of one of these sets, say an even number, and maybe we take two of those, two even numbers, and then we use this operator uh, on those two even numbers. Now here I, I chose two because the multiplication operator, uh, at least the, the normal basic one, is a binary operator, which means it takes two arguments, right? We can't just multiply uh, one number. That doesn't really make sense. The squaring operator takes one number and then we multiply it to itself. Um, but normally, our normal way that multiplication works is a binary operator. And of course, we could uh, extend that to more than two. But so here I said, what if we had two numbers in our basic binary operator of multiplication, two even numbers, we multiply them together, and we have proven in, in our previous video that that yields uh, an even number. And then likewise, we did the same thing for odds. If we have two odd numbers and we multiply them together, uh, we'll get another odd number. And then we might also, we didn't actually look at this, but we might also consider the other case that we haven't considered here is what if we had two numbers and one was even and one was odd. It doesn't really matter which is even or which is odd, right? Um, uh, but if we have one even and one odd, what happens there? Um, and you might just pick your favorite even and odd number and multiply them together in your head and see what happens. Um, and maybe I'll just leave that as something for you to, to uh, verify for yourself what the outcome will be. Now, uh, when we're talking about, oh, well, I looked at these, but let's take a look at these again. Uh, when we're talking about these particular properties, um, that is when we've got uh, two even numbers and we multiply them and it gives us an even number, let's look at this uh, logical statement here for a second, because again, we're still getting used to, you know, uh, translating things into logic. Uh, but this is also using some set theory, so we're kind of putting uh, together this, this uh, mathematical or logical statement using some of the notation that we've been building up thus far. So let's take a quick look. The first bit here says uh, A is an element of E. That was just saying A is an even number. That's what we were saying before. And then this wedge, remember, means and. So and uh, B is an element of E, so that means A is an even number and B is an even number. And then remember, this is our implication, the if-then, right? So that's saying if A is even and B is even, then A times B is even. And that's exactly what we were saying uh, when we were talking about this property of even numbers. You take two even numbers, multiply them together, and you get another even number. We've just taken that, that statement that I just used in natural English that we all sort of understand very easily, and I've translated that into logic and set theory and math. So now, uh, as you build up your own mathematical intuition and your own mathematical literacy, um, you're going to be able to look at a statement that looks like this and, and very easily sort of translate that back into its meaning in natural language if you need to. Okay, so again here, A is an even number and B is an even number. 
this implies that a times b will be an even number. And then we've got the same thing here stated for odds. a is an odd number, b is an odd number, and then uh, a times b implies, uh, or a times b rather, is an element of o. So start with an odd number, start with a second odd number, multiply them together, and you get an odd number. Now this type of property is a very special kind of property. We call this actually a closure property, and that's what I want to get to next. So say we have a set, well E and O are our sets, and say we have an operation O, well here we pick multiplication. Here I'm just generalizing, okay, say you pick any set S and any operation O that works on elements of that set, okay. Um, then we're going to say that S is closed under that operation if we can do this. If we take elements of our set S, S1, S2, Sn, and then we put those elements as arguments into our operator, and that gives us back something that was still in the original set. Now here, why do I have n arguments? Well, I, I want to be general here about my operator O. I don't know how many arguments it takes. Like our multiplication argument, or sorry, our multiplication operator takes two, right? But we could, we also actually do have some mathematical operators that are unary. Uh, the one that comes to mind is the negation or the, ne the negative operator that can take, say, the number 4 and turn it into minus 4 or neg negative 4. Um, and that operator is unary. It would only take one operator, SI, S1, sorry. Um, and then we could also imagine other operators that uh, uh, might take more than that. Now, we don't usually, uh, we don't usually have some basic operators that take, say, three or four arguments in math, you, I might, you might be able to come up with one, um, but we can generalize some of our operators, like I mentioned here for multiplication, where uh, it can take two as its basic uh, uh, operation, but then we could also define it for three or four and so on. So this is basically saying, hey, I don't know what operator you're talking about. Let's say it takes n arguments. Okay, now take those n arguments, let's grab all of them out of this set S so that we start, say they're all evens or they're all odds or whatever that set S represents, put them through the operator. If what comes out is still from that set S, then we would say that the set S is closed under that operation O. So another way of what, saying what we've already just in, investigated or proved here is that our even numbers and our odd numbers are closed under the operation multiplication. That is, start with any two numbers in that set, get another number out of that set after you, you apply the uh, operator multiplication. Let's just think for a second about that unary operator I talked about, which was negation. Okay, negation, which takes, say, minus 4 and turns it into 4, or, or vice versa, 4 into minus 4. Um, if we have an even number, does it give us back an even number? Well, 4 turns into minus 4, minus 4 turns into 4. Yeah, evens turn into evens and odds turn into odds. So the even numbers and the odd numbers are also closed under this unary operator, okay, the negation, right? Now, uh, so we mentioned this. What about another binary operator that we can think about? What about addition? Okay, again, um, what we're speaking about here, for it to be closed, it has to work every time, okay? Uh, and this is something that I haven't really uh, uh, made explicit yet, uh, but what this means is if we want, if this is supposed to be true, uh, if we take two even numbers and we add them together and we get another even number, that if that happens every time, then it's closed under, uh, under addition as well. So let's think, is that indeed true? Think about the proof that we did uh, uh, in the last video and see if you could come up with a proof for your own for this one. In fact, in this case, let's see, an even plus an even does give us another even. What about an odd plus an odd? Well, that one's maybe uh, a little bit trickier to see, um, but the, the lucky part of this is if we can find any two odd numbers that if we added them together, they gave us not an odd number, then that would mean it's not true. Right? So all we need to do is try and think, well, luckily for us, if we pick any, pick your favorite two odd numbers, you know, three and five, but add them together, they give us eight. Well, that's not an odd number. So uh, since, since those two don't work, then it must not be closed under addition. So it turns out evens are, but odds are not closed under addition. 
Okay, can we prove this? Well, I, w I waved my hand at it there. I gave you a proof that maybe convinced your internal logic computer, but maybe is not rigorous enough uh, for, for a mathematical proof. Well, if you want to practice your proof, go ahead. I'm going to leave that as a little bit of an exercise here. Uh, all right, so let's start talking about some other sets of numbers. We looked at the, the evens and the odds. Well, those, while as interesting as they might be for certain uh, types of you know problems, they're really uh, kind of uh, not the in most interesting sets of numbers. Now, one set of numbers that is sort of a, an interesting set, uh, we sometimes call it the natural numbers, or we, we, we sometimes also call these the counting numbers or the cardinal numbers. That's another name for them in mathematics. Um, but they, they are sometimes considered to be the natural numbers, and that's the name we, we often give them, uh, because they were sort of the first set of numbers that we as humans and you know as we uh, invented mathematics uh, we the very first set of numbers we worked with were the natural numbers and in fact the natural numbers are the set of numbers that we worked with even before we were humans there are there's a lot of evidence in animal psychology uh, and animal ethology that suggests that uh, our our primate uh, cousins are able to uh, uh, count up to certain uh, uh, values, maybe not very high, uh, and even that other animals outside the primates uh, and the great apes uh, also have uh, some concepts of numericity of some kinds. Um, an, an interesting and fun experiment uh, related to this um, uh, has to do with crows. Crows are, and ravens are actually very intelligent uh, bird species um, and there has been some experiments that have shown that, that common crows um, have the concept of, of zero, one, and two, and then after two the number is just many or lots or something like that. So they can sort of count up to two and then kind of get to three and know that it's more than two. So they sort of have like four numbers, zero, one, two, and more than two. Uh, and the interesting sort of experiment that they did to sort of uncover this involves some, some uh, crows that were sort of, they would sort of be feeding in this clearing and then say a human would come by and disturb their feeding, they would fly up into the trees and then, and then the, maybe the human would walk out of, out of uh, view into the forest and they would stay in the trees until the human came back and left and they knew it was safe. Uh, and, they, and so the experimenters would test. They would send one human in, one human would come out, they'd come down, it was safe. They'd send two humans in, two humans came out, they would come down, it was safe. They send uh, three humans in and two humans came out, the birds would come down and it was safe and they assume something about uh, how much they can count to. So again, these numbers are very natural in that they exist in the natural world uh, beyond even human, human beings. So we can, we can sort of argue that they exist and they are important in the world beyond just human existence. So these are what we call the natural numbers and these are the first set of numbers and these are also what's known as the counting numbers because um, we use them to count. And so you can also imagine the first humans in the beginning of our first uh, economics uh, in terms of trade and, and whatnot, where we would need to know, you know, how many chickens and how many goats and so on we might want to trade for, a, you know, a bushel of hay or whatever it was that was going on in that type of barter, barter system. Um, I also have an uh, interesting sort of note here that zero is sometimes omitted from this, especially if we're telling the historical tale that I'm sort of talking about here, uh, which is the actual concept of zero, even though we wouldn't say that, you know, ancient humans didn't have the concept of nothing or, or, or the lack of something. It's just the number zero, the actual number and a symbol for it. Um, didn't actually appear until around the 6th century and there are some interesting sort of technological uh, uh, hangovers related to that. Uh, uh, one example of this uh, is the, the phrase point blank which uh, some of you might know is to mean means to sort of shoot someone from a very close range um, and this actually came from earlier early uh, uh, siege weaponry like well cannons but before that more likely you know catapults and, and ballistae and so on you would have to uh, calculate what angle you want to you know fling your rocks at or whatnot uh, to see if it would hit the wall 
Um, and if you want to hit something that's right in front of you, you would bring the angle all the way down to angle zero, which is, is it would shoot it straight out right in front of you. Um, and that was called point blank back in the day because there was no, there was no zero for that number. There was point one, point two, point three, and so on, which were different angles that you could, you could angle it up to, but point blank uh, was, uh, well, was shooting right straight in front of you. So another interesting uh, sort of just little tale about the, the origins of the natural numbers um, and that the natural numbers have been with us a very long time. They have existed for a long time. And so it's probably also not uh, too surprising that, you know, there were some uh, ancient philosophers and mathematicians who, who came up with the concept of infinity, the idea that our natural numbers don't end, that they continue on. Uh, uh, any natural number that you can imagine, there's always going to be one that's larger than that. And that's another characteristic of the counting numbers. And that, that idea maybe is what really spurs off some of the more theoretical uh, uh, branches of mathematics. The, the trading, you know, trading goats and chickens and so on, that may be something that a shepherd and a, and a, and a farmer might need to do a long time ago. Um, uh, they never were worried about the concept of infinity goats. That was not a problem they had to worry about. And even the concept of a hundred goats might, was, might have been something they didn't need to worry about. Um, but the theoretical mathematicians, the philosophers who, who continued to think about numbers bigger and bigger than any that might be you know, necessary for day-to-day -day work, um, started thinking about you know, infinity. Okay, so let's take our set here, uh, N, and let's uh, apply the uh, principles that we were just looking at um, with our even numbers and our odd numbers. So N, again, are being our set of natural numbers. What operators is it closed under? Well, here we'll do a quick test. If we take two natural numbers and we add them together, do we get another natural number? Well, that whole idea I was just talking about infinity um, we can kind of prove that there are in infinite numbers if this is true. If we can take two natural numbers and add them together, and that always gives us another natural number, then we can argue or prove that there will always be infinite numbers. And we could do that even with just starting with one natural number, the number one. If we take the number one, we add it to itself, we get two. Now we have two natural numbers. That must be a natural number two, it says, it tells us. Well, add one to that, we get three. Add one to that, we get four, and so on. Keep adding one, we will get all infinity of that. Okay, we will never end here. Any number you're at, you could add one to it and get another one. Okay. Now, notice, I've got a claim here. This is a theorem, but I'm going to say we're not going to prove this theorem. Now, why not? Well, this is something that we're going to take, at least today, as an axiom. It's something we might be able to prove if we, if we broke things down to even smaller bits, okay? But at some point in mathematics and logic, we have to go down to what we sometimes call base principles, which is, you know, we just need to stop the, the, the doubt and the questioning as we go down somewhere and say, okay, we're just going to believe this, okay? Um, and so, uh, in this case, when we stop and we just assume something is true and we don't, we don't ask for a proof, we don't expect a proof, we give it a special name, we we'll sometimes call this an axiom. Something that we take to be true without proof. And a, and a large number of things that we take to be true without proof are basically just definitions. If you're defining what a word is, there's no reason to question the definition. But it's uh, semantics if we start questioning uh, uh, the definition. Um, now, if we pivot, so we're not going to prove that the natural numbers are, are closed under addition. I guess we didn't look too closely at multiplication, but it's true for that as well. Um, but if we look at another uh, operator, uh, there's sort of the four bi the big four operators for arithmetic are addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And we just said that natural numbers are closed under addition and multiplication. But taking a closer look, when we say, wait a second, if we try and do subtraction, if we do the same business, one minus one is zero, that's fine as long as we're letting zero be in our natural numbers. But zero minus one is minus one. And minus one is not one of those natural numbers. It's not a number that the shepherds and the farmers needed. 
And it's not a number that the crows need either. It's not a natural number. It is a number that theoreticians need. It's a number that a banker needs to tell you that you, that you owe them money. It is not it is not a number that a regular, you know, regular trade is going to require. Okay. So, what that means is the natural numbers are not closed under subtraction if we can get outside of the set n using the operator here, subtraction. Okay. So, here I've, I've included a little bit of a proof. Let's see if we can follow that through. Now, I've already did this hand wavily. That is, I've already structured the proof when I just spoke it to you here a second ago. But let's code it together. Let's try and put it together into a formal, well, not a formal, an informal proof. We're not going to formalize this all the way down to uh, rules of logic and so on. Uh, uh, but we are going to just test as we go to make sure that each step is actually uh, written down. So let's take a look here. So. What are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove the set of, set of natural numbers is not closed under subtraction. Now remember, when we were talking about this earlier, all that means is we need to find some example that can show that we get outside the set. So let's see if we can do this. We're going we're gonna to make an interesting type of assumption here. I'm going to assume, for the sake of contradiction, this proof is what's called a proof by contradiction. We, we're going to end up getting there by trying yeah, by, by assuming something completely different. So let's see. So what are we going to prove? We're trying to prove here that the set of natural numbers is not closed under subtraction, but we're going to assume for the sake of contradiction that it is closed under subtraction. So in a proof by contradiction, what we do is we assume the opposite of what we're trying to prove. Now why is that? The hope is we're going to get a contradiction. And that contradiction Remember from our earlier video, contradiction is something that is always false. Well, if making any assumption leads to a contradiction, that means the assumption must be false. And that's how this proof works. So let's follow it through. So again, we're going to assume for the sake of contradiction that the natural numbers is closed under subtraction. Then, here I'm just stating what that means, the definition. If A is in N and B is in N, then A minus B is in N. Okay, well, let's pick two natural numbers that we like. 0 is in n, 1 is in n, then 0 minus 1, which is equal to minus 1, should be in n according to our, our argument here, according to our assumption that n is closed under subtraction. So since it is not, this is a contradiction. This is what we were looking for, and therefore our assumption must be false, so n must not be closed under subtraction. Okay, so... We did that earlier with a very quick one or two skips. All I said is, hey, think of zero. Zero minus one, that's negative one. That's not a natural number. That was, this is sort of the work that's doing the heavy lifting. This is the clever bit. But the rest of this, the machinery around here, is the machinery of a proof by contradiction. Assume something is true to show that something absurd would happen, and then conclude that your assumption must be false. So, just as an example, uh, this is a proof by a counterexample, this is also a proof of, a, of an existence proof, and this is also a proof by contradiction. Now, what is a proof of a counterexample? A proof of a counterexample is one where you just find some example that works. So, here's that's what we did. We found 0 and 1 worked. Other examples would work as well. 0 and 2 would work, and so on. Okay, um, And it's an existence proof. This is These two sort of uh, sometimes go hand in hand, that the counterexample we're providing is also proving that something exists. So in this case, we're proving there exists some natural numbers that if we sub compute the subtraction of them, we end up outside the natural number set. Okay, so one thing that we sort of brought in here um, is when we brought in subtraction is we're bringing in the idea of an inverse operation. The uh, the addition operation has an inverse in that subtraction, and I have that sort of indicated here. Uh, x plus y minus y, so if we add and subtract the same thing, we get back to where we started. Or, in a more general sense, if we have O of x, or it could be any number of arguments, the inverse operation, if we apply it back, will give us back the, uh, the uh, same same uh, value we started with, the argument we started with here, x. So uh, we often indicate the inverse operation with this minus 1 exponent. Okay, um, 
So let's can, let's go through a couple that we're already familiar with. So the inverse to multiplication we're probably familiar with is going to be division. Multiplying by y and dividing by y gives us back to where we are. Okay. Uh, the inverse to exponentiation is going to be the logarithm. So this is a very important one for computer scientists. Uh, if you end up watching my video series on uh, data structures uh, or algorithms, um, you will notice this one shows up a lot. Okay, 2 to the log base 2 of n is n. And I've chosen base 2 here because, again, base 2 is sort of the important base for computer science. What about the inverse to squaring? Well, again, maybe we know that that one's going to be the square root. I put that here when we could have also written this as the exponent 1 over 2, of course, which we know we, the 1 over 2 and the 2 would cancel out just to give us the exponent 1 that we have here. Okay. Now, uh, I did put a little note here that this is true in the natural numbers, but not necessarily true in the integers um, because uh, the square operator, if I take minus 2 times minus 2, um, that gives me 4. Oh. So square root of that gives me 2, and that didn't give me back to where I was supposed to. It gives me the absolute value. So the square root actually doesn't get us back to where we wanted to be. So unfortunately, we might have to look elsewhere for an inverse operator. But here I just wanted to bring up the idea, probably an idea that we're already familiar with, the idea of an inverse operation. Okay, so that brings me back to this idea of, the, let's go back to the natural numbers and the operator subtraction. Say we wanted to extend the natural numbers, we wanted to grow it, so that it was closed under subtraction. What numbers would we have to add in? Well, we already saw that we would have to add in minus 1, but also minus 2 and minus 3, and all of the negative numbers, right? All of them would eventually be needed if we do the same sort of, the same sort of domino effect with minus 1 that we did with plus 1. With plus 1 to argue there's infinite positive numbers, with minus 1 to argue that there's infinite negative numbers. Well, if we add all those infinite negative numbers in, we end up with a new set. And in mathematics, we use the letter uh, Z for that or Z for that, um, and, and that is the set of integers. Okay. And so here I'm going to say that another way we can phrase this is we can say the integers are the closure of the set of natural numbers. So again, We've got the set of natural numbers. Say we want to turn it into a closed set with the operator subtraction. If we did that, we'd end up with z, the set of integers. So, so again, z we might say is the closure of n under the operation of subtraction. Another couple interesting points here is that the, uh, the integers uh, can be written as the natural numbers union the uh, negative integers, which we sometimes write here as z with the negative exponent, and that shows us again that these two sets then partition the integers. So remember this, this uh, set theory word partition kind of does a lot of extra work for us. It says it splits, us, splits them into two sets where the two sets don't share any, uh, they don't have any overlap, they have a dis they're disjoint, they have an intersection that is empty. Uh, and then also if you take them and you, you union them back together like this, you get the original set back again. So, so again, maybe not too uh, mysterious, the natural numbers and the negative integers partition Z. Another way we could partition uh, the integers is into three sets, the positive integers, the negative integers, and then zero, the special integer that is neither positive nor negative. All right, um, so we talked about the inverse operation, so now we can also talk about another idea in, uh, in algebra, which again is probably one you're familiar which, with, which is the idea of an additive inverse. So here the additive inverse is really in the natural numbers or in the, sorry, in the integers is going to be the, the negation of the number. So if you have the number four, the negation is minus four. And the cool thing about your additive inverse is if you take them and you add them together, you get zero. Okay, so four plus minus four is zero. And so we actually have this sort of as a definition, oops, um, and then we can also say that that makes zero an important special uh, ent entity. We call it the identity. Um, and so this element is the one that, well, when you take the additive inverse, you get zero. But another way of saying that is 
uh, or another important feature rather of, of the identity element is if we take that element and we add it to any element we just get that element back again so a plus zero is, is a now the interesting thing here is when we're trying to abstract away in abstract algebra we're trying to even abstract away from this idea of addition so here I'm borrowing the idea that you already know how addition works so a plus minus a all of our internal computers go aha that's zero oh so you get the idea of an additive inverse well we could swap out addition here for multiplication so here my note down here is saying say we use the operation multiplication instead then we could get the multiplicative inverse which is something together different and we don't usually use minus for it anymore okay and the note that I've got down here is that the identity element for multiplication is 1 not 0 right a times 1 is a a times 0 is 0 and that's 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 a problem and a puzzle altogether different that's that is going to cause us a different you know a, a different set of uh, issues down the road but here the comment is that when we start talking about multiplication our identity change or sorry our I you know our identity element changes from zero for addition to one with multiplication okay so the last concept is related to inversion invertible so we talked about this already when we were looking at our inverse operations so how do we know if a operation is invertible uh, well it's invertible if and only if there exists a inverse for that particular element so here we've just generalized that idea say we have some operation O that operates here I've just made it binary operator but we could generalize this as we did earlier uh, we've got some set S again generalized uh, we're going to say it's invertible this is the definition now if for every A in S there is now here is that inverse I'm using the minus symbol as though we're doing plus but here I'm just borrowing that from this notation up here to indicate that what we're looking for is some other element such that when we put those two elements through our operator we get our identity element and as I've noted here that uh, above where we might just call it minus a when we're doing plus the as our operator is addition when we use uh, multiplication instead we often indicate this as a to the minus one which of course a to the minus one times a gives us one which is the identity element in um, with with respect to multiplication all right so uh, this brings us to the the only really formal definition of uh, from al abstract algebra that I'm going to give you if you if you like this in interesting idea you think this is cool you want to explore it more please do explore some uh, you know some uh, abstract algebra math uh, that's going to take you into into fields and, and uh, rings and so on um, but for our purposes here this is meant only to be subject matter to, to, to write a few proofs about uh, but let's just see here what is an algebraic group so say we have a set s let's say it's like the natural numbers and we have the uh, operator plus let's say it's addition plus um, and then we have all the following properties uh, then we'll call it an algebraic group so uh, let's take a look at each of the properties the first property property one uh, s is closed under the operation okay well that's why we've been talking about closure so natural numbers is it closed under under addition yes okay we're good the operation plus is associative let's go look what was that again that said a plus B so that was this one about the brackets saying I can rewrite my brackets however I want well because we're just talking about addition and multiplication both of which are associative we don't really need to even look too closely at this we already know those operators are associative so boom check two is done okay uh, property three there's an identity element zero okay such that a plus zero is a that's true for the natural numbers and plus well as long as we include zero in there and then the operation plus is invertible actually this is the only property that the natural numbers and the operation plus violates there is the, the operation is not invertible because there's not going to be an inverse for every natural number in fact there's no inverse for any natural number except for zero zero is its own inverse um, however if we changed our set s here 
from the natural numbers to be integers, then we do get invertibility. So the integers with addition is an algebraic group. The definition finishes off by saying that if, if the operator here plus is also commutative, then we call this a commutative group or an abelian group. So actually, the, the set, uh, the integers z with the operator plus is a commutative or abelian group because addition is also commutative. So I think I've already commented this, uh, z plus is, in a, is a group. Um, z with multiplier, uh, multiplication is not uh, a group and that's because, and you can go ahead and verify this yourself, it violates um, a couple, well it violates invertibility, okay, but it also, uh, uh, well it, invites, it, it vi violates invertibility for a couple different reasons, we'll put it that way. So go ahead and see if you can figure that one out. Um, and then what happens if we take the integers and we take uh, both operators and we can consider them together? There's again another definition in, in group theory or in uh, abstract algebra uh, that we'll call this a commutative ring. Now, this when we start talking about commutative rings or fields in, these, in groups and so on, the purpose of studying this from a math, mathematician's uh, standpoint is to better understand the number systems that we actually work in and then to understand other mathematical systems that work like the number system. Now, as computer scientists, this is going to be coming, this comes in handy in a couple of interesting places. One uh, important place where you're going to use group theory, ring theory, and so on is going to be in cryptography. So while you might be looking at these definitions now, say this is sort of interesting stuff, but maybe put it on the back burner, when you get to, to start looking deeper into cryptography, you're going to pull this back out again and say, oh yeah, I do kind of remember what a algebraic group is. And of course, hopefully then you will take some time to review this. Let's continue uh, on. So I think I already talked about this one in my example. Um, so let's push on to uh, another sort of topic that I want to bring into while we're talking about group theory here, which is the idea of modular arithmetic. So modular arithmetic, and, and again, I expect a lot of my audience to be computer scientists or computer scientists in training. And that means you've probably already encountered the mod operator somewhere in your in your computer science studies up till now mod operator is going to be sort of one half of an integer division operator and when we do integer division unlike a lot of our other uh, uh, operators that we looked at here are most of our operators spit out one output but integer division spits out two the quotient and the remainder and specifically the mod operator is the one that gives us the remainder of, of a divided by b so we might just call that mod, like I've got written here, or if, again, you're used to some programming languages, we'll often use the percent symbol here as our mod operator as well. So um, let's go ahead and define a new set. This is going to be sort of an interesting set. This is a set that's studied a lot when you, when you take a look at uh, abstract algebra, which is Zn, okay, or Zn, which is going to be the integers modulo n. Now, the set of integers modulo n. So imagine you took any all the integers to start out and you just perform this operation mod n on each of them, okay, on each of the integers. Well, it would turn out, because of the way that remainder works, that all of our remainders always come back in this set between 0 and n minus 1. We can't have a remainder of n or greater when we're doing a division by n. So what that does is it takes our normal set of integers, which is infinite, and it reduces it down to a finite size set, one that only contains n elements in it, because it contains zero in it, but stops at n minus one. Okay. This is a very interesting set of numbers, becomes useful in a lot of things. If we have counters, uh, our counters have this set because they overflow and take back. Our integers, when we use them in our programming languages, are actually integers of this kind, not integers out of capital Z, Z integers. It's their integers out of Z sub n for some n. And typically this might be like 2 to the 32 for 32-bit integers and so on. Okay, So we know that this is a better representation of, of integers in, uh, in inside the machine. And sometimes we care about this, again, as I mentioned, say we're doing some cryptography.
So here's just a quick example. Let's say we did, instead of Zn, we did Z5. Uh, so we have zero up to four, okay? And then let's consider a couple operations. Now the cool thing is when we define operations on these sets, we always say, take the two numbers, and then when you're done, do mod five again, so we end up back in this set. What does that do for us? It ensures that we're closed. Let's, let's do a quick example. So here I said three plus two. If we take three plus two in our normal set, Z, we get five, and five isn't in this set, right? Well, let's say we do two plus three, and then we do mod five. Two plus three is five. It actually gives us zero. So two plus three in Z five is zero. And the way we could think about that is imagine we had sort of a, uh, a uh, integer value in our computer programming system where overflow happened after four instead of at two to the 32 or wherever it was. If we counted two and we tried to add three to it, we'd go one, two, overflow would bring us back around to zero again. And that's exactly what we're trying to capture here with this set. Okay, what about three times three then? Well, it turns out it's easy for us to compute that as well. All we need to do is do it in the normal integers. Three times three is nine, and then run mod five again. So it gives us four. So three times three is four in this set. Okay, um, what is x if x plus four equals zero? This is asking a question about the inverse of x. Is there an inverse of x? Well, 1 plus 4 gives us 5, so that's 0. So yes, and 2 is the inverse of 3, and 0 is the inverse of 0. So everything has an inverse in here. So Zn, uh, uh, Zn with the addition operator is an uh, abelian group. Uh, okay, so we mentioned closure already. Um, so we've already talked about uh, Zn with addition. Zn with multiplication has some trouble uh, because of the zero operator in there, okay? Um, you might be able to have some numbers that get you back to, to one, but the problem is multiplying by zero gives us zero, and that, that makes things problematic. Again, these are just subject matter for interest's sake. If you're interested more in abstract algebra, I encourage you to look more into that. Okay, I'm, we're trying to grow our numbers here. We've gone from natural numbers into into the integers and took a, a sort of sidestepped in, into abstract algebra for a second. Well, let's keep growing further. We didn't talk about division yet. We did div integer division where we got remainders and quotients. But of course, you know, this, this, this historical path we're going on is the history of math. We started with natural numbers. Somewhere along the way, we needed negative numbers. And then somewhere along the way, we needed rational numbers too. This is also the path you probably took during your education as a student. You started with natural numbers, you learned how to count, do some addition and multiplication, and then later on they said, well now we need to get the negatives in there. And then later on they said, well let's study some fractions, let's get into rational numbers. And so that's where we are here. We say we're going to do division. What happens when we divide three by two? We get three halves, which is a, is a rational number. Now, the definition of the rational number is, gonna, is going to make use of our definition of the integers. So we can, this is one definition of a rational number. There's more than one definition. This one's saying all rational numbers can be written as P divided by Q, such that both P and Q are integers, but more, Q is a positive integer saying that if this is a negative rational number, the negative comes on the P part. Now that's fine, okay? Um, here I've got maybe a little question for us. Can we prove that the integers is a subset of the rational numbers, or more, more importantly here, let's be precise, is a proper subset of the rational numbers? Okay, so let's see if we can do that. And to do that, I'm actually going to make this a little bit easier on myself by splitting it into two. So here I've got my theorem. So by splitting it into two, by looking at what the definition of this proper subset means, it means that uh, the integers are a subset of the rationals and they're not equal to, right? Remember this symbol here means subset or equal to. 
but this one means subset and not equal to so that extra bit is there okay so we're going to prove both of these the first one is subsets and we have a rule about that remember how do we prove that something is a subset of the other the proof is if we have an element of the first one then it's an element of the second one so let's start with that one uh, the integers are a, su a subset of q so again I'm just taking what I just said, which is the definition of subset, which is saying that if we have some element that's an integer, then it must also be a, a rational number. So let's start, let's assume we have an integer. Let's start with some p that is an integer. And then we're going to say, well, what makes it a rational number is if we can write it this way. Well, I'm just going to pick my q then to be 1 because p then will be equal to p over q, or just p. Um, and we can see that 1 satisfies the condition for q. 1 is a positive integer, so we're good. So, at the end of that, that means that p must be a, a rational number, so we're done. We've proven that every, any p that you might like that is an integer is also a rational number. Now, the other half is we need to prove that it's not equal to. And that means we need to show that there is some element, if we already know this relationship holds, the subset relationship holds, then that means we need to find some rational number that is not an integer. So to prove this, we must find any p that's q that is not uh, a z, not an integer. So I just picked my favorite, 1 half. 1 half is in, in q. That's easy to verify. Why? Because 1 is in z and 2 is, in z is a positive integer, so done. And then uh, it's also easy to note, I'm, not, I'm claiming this without proof, that 1 half is not an integer. Okay, hopefully all of you believe me that 1 half is not, a, not an integer. So, uh, so again, I'm going to conclude here they're not equal. And therefore, uh, by following both these two proofs here, uh, we immediately conclude that z must be a proper subset of q. Now you'll notice here I've, I've split both of these proofs off and I've called them lemmas. Lemmas are, are theorems, they're just another name for a theorem, but they're usually a theorem that we prove along the way to something more interesting that we're trying to prove. So we were trying to prove this theorem up here, z is a, a proper subset of q, and we did it by proving two maybe less interesting theorems that together gave us what we were looking for. So we call those lemma one and two, and we use them in our final step of the proof. Okay, so I just wanna make a couple final comments about uh, the rational numbers. Um, the rational numbers are really an important set of numbers. They're, for most human beings, they are all the numbers you're ever going to need. And when I say that, I know a lot about other numbers too, and I really don't feel I've ever needed them. Um, and so hopefully if you're out there and you say, what about complex numbers and so on? Yeah, those exist, but we really don't need them very often. Uh, and when we do need them in the real world, we can often get away with just pretending they were rational numbers, especially for real numbers. Um, however, um, the interesting thing about the rational numbers that I want to bring up is we can, we can grab all of our operators here, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and it turns out that our rational numbers are closed under all of them. So we finally got to a place where for our big four, if you want to call these our big four, then we're, we're good with the rational numbers. We don't need to go very further. And actually, in this, this field of abstract algebra that we've been talking about, we have a term that is called field, uh, which is when you have some set like the rational numbers here, where all your operators, addition and multiplication and their inverses, operate normally, meaning you don't end up outside the set and so on, and operate how we expect, associatively, commutatively, and so on, then we call this a field. And so the, the rational numbers are a field. Um, other numbers that are fields that are of interest to us are the real numbers and the complex numbers that I'm not going to say too much about. Um, but the natural numbers and the integers are not. And in that sense, the natural numbers and the integers are in some sense um, impoverished. There's some sense that they're missing out on something. Okay. But the rational numbers fills in those gaps. And like I said, most of the math that you can do in the world, you probably only need rational numbers to do it. Uh, so you're good to go. 
Okay, I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of interesting comments about why you need real numbers. I'd love to hear them. Uh, okay, let's take a look at another interesting proof. This is a real sort of famous, popular proof in discrete math uh, texts and, and classes. So I'm going to include it here uh, in this video series as well, so you don't feel like you've been, you know, let you've missed anything out. This is the proof uh, that a particular number is irrational. So we just started talking about rational numbers. What about irrational numbers? Now I talked about a proof of contradiction already earlier in this, so that's the, the strategy we're going to use. But the proof that I want to make is that this number, the square root of 2, is irrational. Now the cool thing here about this uh, proof is that it's going to rely on this proof by contradiction, but it's also pretty clever. Okay, It's not exactly something you're going to uh, come up with. Uh, on your own unless you're already a uh, number theorist or you like numbers, okay? Uh, and some of you might like numbers, so you might be able to come up with something on, like this on your own. Uh, but here I'm just going to use it as an example of a proof by contradiction and also to continue our discussion of, of numbers. So let's see if we can do this. Now, remember what happened in a proof by contradiction earlier? It was when we assume the negation of what we're trying to prove. Okay, so here, what is the negation of this sentence? The square root of 2 is irrational. That ear, that ear prefix means not, right? So we can just erase it, scribble it out. That would give us the square root of 2 is rational. That's the negation of what we're trying to prove. So that's how I'm going to start out. Assume, and often when you're doing a proof by contradiction, you want to put this little little bit blurb in here the for the sake of contradiction is not necessary here we don't need it but this is what i sometimes call like a way post or a way sign that i put along the way for my reader it's letting my reader know what i'm doing so they don't get surprised down the way okay this is not some kind of mystery story or horror story where at the end the reader is supposed to go oh my god square root of two is irrational no we're trying to let them follow along with us okay so we don't we want to give them signs along the way saying here's what we're doing so here we're basically saying heads up i'm doing a proof by contradiction here okay so assume for the sake of that contradiction then that the square root of two is rational why else do we put that in there well if you're about to prove one thing and the very first thing you do is assume the opposite some people might get confused but if you go ahead and say hey look i'm doing this on purpose for this type of proof that i'm making then they'll say oh yeah okay now i remember proof by contradiction you're doing that for the sake of getting a contradiction at the end okay so that's what we're doing we're assuming it's rational now remember what does that tell us and most of the time when we're trying to write a proof the very first step we have to do is apply some definition or another and the definition I'm going to apply here is the definition of rational. Okay, so if it's rational, then it can be written as p over q for again two. I've chosen natural numbers here for the sake for the moment. Um, we had integers before. Why have I eliminated integers? Square root of two is not negative. I'm just sort of ignoring the fact that there's ne that there could be negative rational numbers. We've got a positive one here. So we've got this, and where q is not equal to zero. Remember in that last definition where I had uh, q had to be out of the positive integers? There was a secret subtle reason there was I was trying to not make it zero. If it's zero, we get division by zero. Let's not go down that, uh, down that snake pit. Okay, so, um, so again, this assumption we made that, that square root of 2 is rational means that we can write it in this way. And then I'm also going to go and add one extra bit. Anytime we write a fraction, we know we can write it in lowest terms, which is what we, we would sometimes do as an exercise in, in uh, arithmetic, right? Take a fraction and reduce it into its lowest terms, reduce all the common factors. So well, let's just assume we've already gone ahead and done that too. So we're writing square root of 2. We can write it in this way as two integers or natural numbers, and they share no common factors. So we've already fully reduced it down. Okay, now here's where a little bit of cleverness comes in follow along with me. So now let's say we just uh, take both sides and we square it. So the square root of 2 times the square root of 2 gives us 2. The other side, p over q squared, obviously just gives us p squared over q squared. So after we square both sides, we're here. 2, 2 equals p squared over q squared. Now the cool thing is, let's just bring the q squared up to the other side. That now means that uh, p squared is equal to 2 times q squared. 
Now follow with me. Remember our definition of even numbers? Even numbers are 2 times some number, right? So this means p squared must be even. Now, we've been putting a lot of pieces together here, and I'm not trying to skip over too many steps, but remember that if you take an even number and you multiply it by an even number, you get another even number. That's how we started this video today, right? So what this is saying is we're actually taking that backwards. We're saying I took a number and I multiplied it by itself to itself and I got an even number. What does that mean about P originally? Could it have been odd? Ah, actually no it couldn't have been because remember if I took an odd number and I multiplied it by an odd number it gives me an odd number. So Putting that piece together that we started this video with, we're saying, oh, if P squared is even, then so must P. So P is even. So, okay, I said follow me, follow me along here with my cleverness, and I, and I got to the point that P must be even. Okay, so if P is even, so we could rewrite P as 2K, okay, then P squared must be 4 times K squared, right? We just squared both sides here. So now my 2 times q squared, which is equal to p squared, must be equal to 4 times k squared. Again, just follow along with me. Dividing out by 2 on each side says q squared is equal to 2 times k squared. So the same reasoning that we just did up above, that means q squared must be re even and q must be even. So q is even too. <clears throat> okay, you followed me down. Uh, you followed me down uh, uh, the rabbit hole, and where have we got? I don't know, right? This is the way that some proofs go. It is a little mystery, I guess. I'm going to surprise you at the end with a con contradiction. What's our contradiction? Well, let's take a look here. P is even. Q is even. Then that means they share a common factor, but we assumed up here that they did not share a common factor. So what have we got? Up here, they don't have a common factor. Down here, they do have a common factor. Therefore, we've got a contradiction. Okay. Since we've got our contradiction, that means the original assumption we made all the way at the beginning must be false. So that is, if the square root of 2 was irrational, a contradiction happens, an absurdity happens. So that can't possibly be the case. So it must be irrational. And we're done. Okay. So that was a proof that the square root of 2, and maybe I'll just go back to that for a second. The square root of 2 is irrational, and you might know some other irrational numbers. In your calculus studies, you may have already encountered, you know, e or pi and so on, these other numbers that we know to be irrational. And you might be interested to try and prove those to be irrational as well. Some of them have similar kind of uh, techniques as these. Uh, here, you need a little bit of cleverness and to know what kind of what path you want to go down uh, but you can try that uh, a proof by contradiction is a good strategy for that okay now all those numbers that are irrational the square root of 2 the square root of 5 e uh, um, uh, pi I almost said i not i um, all those different numbers are all irrational numbers um, and there's actually infinite irrational numbers as well um, so we could call it, we can go ahead and say there's a set of irrational numbers. Typically we don't give the set of irrational numbers a name, okay? Uh, it's just those numbers that are not rational, okay? But we do extend the rational numbers to include the irrational numbers and we call that set R, which is also a set of numbers that you're probably most used to working with. Now again, Let's, I'm going to speak to the computer scientist in you for a second. Um, when you're working with numbers, we talked about integers before, uh, the other type you have are doubles or floats, or usually what they're called. Um, but those types of numbers, uh, our instinct is to assume that they are uh, uh, real numbers. And you might have had you know, lecturers or instructors tell you they are real numbers, but they are not. They are rational numbers, because there are no real numbers inside the machine. Uh, we don't have the precision to write the real number. And this is maybe a great way to express this. The square root of 2 here, inside the machine, gets cut off at some point, maybe here. The dot dot dots are not in there. At some point, the dot 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 gets cut off. Okay, uh, And that's because, of course, this dot 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 is expressing that this goes on for infinity, and it's not even a, an infinity that repeats itself. It's an infinity that, we, that has a pattern that continues to change. 
So here I've got some cool uh, version, the cool irrational numbers, ones that you might know. Um, the, the, these are all ones I named except for phi here, the golden ratio, another cool number. Go look it up if you want to know some interesting stuff about that. Um, I have a couple videos in my series about that if you can flip forward to one of them. Um, but let's take a look at an interesting property about irrational numbers. So one is that they have these infinite non-repeating decimals. Okay. Well, most rational numbers do not. So in a good example, here's a rational number one half that when we write it in base 10, at least uh, we write it as 0 0.5. Now, another thing you might know is that a number like one third or one ninth um, has a repeating decimal and this number because I can write it as one third, right? Like I've written it here. We know is a rational number, but it also has this infinite decimal expansion if we write it using the decimal point expansion, okay? So here's sort of the, an interesting question. Is there a way for us to write one third so that it does not have the infinite decimal expansion? And so the answer to this is, is no, if we stick in base 10, but yes, if we can switch our base. Okay, no, if we stick in base 10, but yes, if we switch our base. So what base should we switch into? And this is sort of an important question. Um, a couple of us might already have some ideas, but probably the first idea that we might come up with is base three. So let's see if we can see why that is. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's maybe take a, an aside here and, and work on some base conversions. Uh, let's take a look at, uh, so what I say here is what is 100 in binary? And actually, I guess that question is ambiguous the way I've written it. I said, what is 100 in binary? Maybe what I'm saying is this is a number that's written in binary. What number is it equal to in decimal? And that's probably an easy one for some of us. That's just four, right? Because this is a ones place the two's place, the four's place, okay? But that's not exactly what I meant in this in the slide. What I actually meant is say we had the, the, the number 100 written in, in maybe base 10, okay? And I wanna know how I can write that in, in base two. So let's see if we can remember how we do that. Well, remember the place values, of course, in base 10, it's one, it's 10, it's 100, 1000, and so on. In, in base two, or in any other base, we're gonna have one, we're gonna have two, two squared, two cubed, two to the fourth. So this is one reason why learning the powers of two is really important if you're a computer scientist, because working in binary, you get these numbers all the time. And of course, I'll just convert a few of these, four, eight, sixteens place, and so on. So writing this in binary, 100 in binary, means finding the largest power of two that is smaller than 100. And that's actually 64. So we actually have one 64. And we can do a little aside over here and say 64. Okay, well, 100 minus 64, what does that give us? That leaves us with 36. Okay, the next spot in binary is the 32 spot, right? And actually 36 is still bigger than that. So we have one of those. We can go ahead here and go 32. How much do we have left? We have four. Now I'm gonna jump ahead here because I know the next spot here is a 16. So we have zero of those. The next spot is an eight. We have zero of those. And then this is a four. The next spot here is four. So we obviously have one of those. And then we must have zero twos and ones. So if we were to write 100 in base two in binary, we write it this way, okay. Okay, looks like we got it right. We didn't mess up our conversion. Okay, now it says on my slide, but quickly convert these uh, to octal and hex. Now, why did I say quickly convert them? Didn't it just take us time to convert them into binary? Why do, why do I think I can do it quickly? Well, actually, if you haven't seen this already, converting binary into octal means grouping them into group of three. And I guess this one here is a zero, zero, one to lead it out and just reading out what those numbers are. Well, this number is four, this number is four, and this number zero, zero, 001 is one. So 100 in octal is 144. 
or 144, I should say. Okay. Remember, octal only uses digits from 0 to 7, okay, instead of 0 to 9. And then, if we want to do the same thing for hex, which uses the digits um, uh, 0 up to f, oops, we don't need this 0 in this case, we group them into blocks of 4, our bits into blocks of 4. And this number is still 4. Uh, and this number, we're looking at this number now, 0, 1, 1, 0 is 6. So in base 16, uh, 100 is written as 64. Interesting. Okay. So uh, th we can convert quickly into octal and hex. Now why do we use octal and hex then? Because there are ways to write binary numbers in a more compact form. So here I had to use how many bits? Uh, seven bits. Here I used uh, three octal digits or two hex digits. So it's just a way to write binary in a more compressed form. Okay, why were we looking at these uh, different, you know, different number systems? We're already hopefully somewhat familiar with our base two and uh, octal and, and hex if we have been working with computer science. Um, but we had a question at, at hand which would, had to do with um, what base should we write our other numbers down. So um, here, I, here I also, I guess on my slide, I've got an uh, introduction to another interesting number system, which is unary. Unary uh, is base 1, which is a terrible number system. If we want to write down 100 in base 1, we only have one digit, which is 0, and guess what? We have to write down 100 of them. So this is an incredibly uncompact way of storing numbers. We don't use that. But writing 100 in base 3, well, we could go do that on, our, on, on the side again. But base 3 is just like binary, but instead of having our place values be 2, 4, and so on, it's 3, 9, 27, and so on. So actually, writing 100 in base 3, here I've got this value. This is going to be the uh, 81's place. That sounds about right, right? 81's place, okay? Um, and then what do we have? Two in the which place? This looks like it's, so this would be the 27's place. This is the 9's place. So two times nine is 18. 18 plus the 81, that gets me to 99 plus one more gets me to 100. So this must be 100 in base 3. Now why did I want to look at base 3? Well, if we take our number 1 over 3 and we go past the decimal point, this is something we don't often do when we convert to numbers, we go past the decimal point, that, that first place after the decimal point in base 3 is the 1 thirds place. So if we want to write one third in base three, it's 0 0.1. And so it has no, uh, no infinite repeating uh, uh, decimal expansion. I can actually prove this, and that's sort of one of the last things I want to do in this video, is show that we can show that for any rational number, that using this decimal system, uh, that there's going to be some base that we can write it with finite non-zero numerals. So let's get started with this. So let's, I'm going to start with a number. I'm going to assume n is a rational number, so that's my first start. Then n can be equal to p over q, where p and q are, are natural numbers, or sorry, are integers, and q is not zero, so uh, we don't divide by zero here again, assuming q is the positive one if there's a negative piece. Now I'm going to have to make a few extra assumptions about n here. I'm not going to make my proof for any old uh, rational number. I'm going to string. I'm going to strip out a couple of them that are easy to work with. So here I'm going to make an uh, an assumption. And here I stress here this phrase without loss of generality. This is a phrase that we use a lot uh, in proofs when we make an assumption that might jeopardize our generality. Now let's go back and consider this for a second. A proof is general if it applies to 
to all instances of its subject matter instead of just a specific instance of its subject matter. And usually when we want to make a general proof, we don't want to risk its generality by making an assumption. So say we wanted to prove that the even numbers were closed under multiplication like we proved earlier. Okay, A general proof is the one that we provided saying we don't know anything about the even numbers we pick 2k and 2l do a little bit of algebra blah 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 show that they're even numbers the specific proof would be say i want to prove that any two even numbers we multiply them together is even and i say well uh pick two and four two times four is eight eight is even therefore it must work for any pair of even numbers of course we can see there's a risk there that maybe that assumption you made that you, the two numbers you're working with are two and four, maybe that was a bad assumption. You risked your generality. It happened to work in that case, but it won't work in all cases. Sometimes we can make an assumption that looks like that, it looks like we're risking our generality, but we're not actually. And so we'll usually point out to our uh, reader, like we do in a lot of uh, phrases we use in our proofs, to say, hey, this one's not jeopardizing my generality. So that's what I'm doing here. So why am I saying this? I'm assuming, assuming without loss of generality that Q is greater than 1. So here, Q greater than 0 assumed it's not 0. Q greater than 1 now is saying that it can't be 1 either. Well, what that did was eliminate all cases where we're not talking about a rational number, we're just talking about an integer. Um, and I'm going to stop right there and say I hope all of us already know that every integer can be written with a finite number of numerals. Because every integer you know of, we write with a finite number of numerals. So that one's pretty easy. So I'm going to eliminate integers. Then the second bit I'm going to go here, okay, so I think that's what I said here. We already know integers and the integer component of our rational numbers can be written with finite non-zero numerals of any base. Okay. So the other thing that I'm assuming here is, is has to do with that second, com, com, second bit there, which is that the absolute value of P, it can be negative, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use absolute value here, that the absolute value must be less than Q. Now what that means is P is less than Q, means that this number, this rational number that I'm interested in, is a rational number between 0 and 1. Now normally, if I start out a proof and I say this is going to apply to any rational number, and then the first thing I do is I say, but assume it's between 0 and 1, you should say, wait a second, that seems like a suspicious argument. Okay, But I'm saying here that I can make this, this assumption without a loss of generality, because that integer component, we already know we can write with a finite number of numerals. So I'm going to cut, ch cut that part off and focus only about the... So if we're thinking about a number that is, you know, x, y, z, dot, something, 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 I'm just cutting off the x, y, z, and I'm saying I'm focusing on the dot, something, something, something. Okay, so again, this first assumption, it's important. It makes it easier what I'm about to prove. Um, but it also doesn't risk my generality, so that's why I'm doing it. Okay, so now let's say we've got n, our number n, and I want to write it in base q. Okay, so I've selected q. Remember when we tried to write one-third, we chose base 3 because that's what made it easy to write. And so here I'm going to write it in, in base q. So notice if we're writing in base q after the decimal place is the 1 over q's place, just like after the decimal place was the 1 over 3 place in, in base 3. And so n must be equal, since we know it's equal to p over q, that's what we assumed up here, it must be equal to 0 point p, where p is whatever that integer is in base q. Okay, and then I've written here a subscript Q to show that this is indeed uh, uh, in base Q, written in base Q. Now, since that's only one, we only need exactly one numeral after the decimal point here, so we're done. So that's a finite number, so we're done. Um, again, this is sort of an interesting property about uh, rational numbers. It was something that I just found interesting when I was a student of discrete math, uh, and so something I thought I'd share. Uh, in this in this video as well. Now I do just want to finish with uh, well what else is out there beyond the rational numbers? We already sort of talked about the real numbers, 
Okay, the real numbers are the rational numbers plus the irrational numbers. Okay, and so we sometimes will just call the irrational numbers, we don't actually have a symbol for them, we'll just say they're r minus q. So take the reals, take out the rationals, and what you're left with are the irrationals. And um, those of you who maybe have explored math in a bit more detail, uh, maybe done some calculus and so on, might be familiar with the complex numbers as well. The complex numbers are formed when we start looking closer at that square root operator. Remember when we, we talked about that very briefly and we said, hey, that didn't work in integers because square root of minus one is undefined until you expand into the complex numbers. And then you say, well, maybe we'll define i to be the square root of minus one. And now we're, we, have, we call this an imaginary number. Um, and now we can write numbers that look like this, alpha plus beta i. And these are uh, where alpha and beta are, rash, are real numbers. And these are now what we call complex numbers. These become important in some math, higher level math. They also become important in some uh, in quantum mechanics, for instance. Um, so um, these, these are numbers that we find important. And even though earlier in this video I said you can live most of your life, you probably won't need a complex number. I still stand by that. You can probably live most of your life and you won't need a complex number. But if you're, uh, if you're a quantum mechanics prof, tells you you need a complex number, you listen to your quantum mechanics prof, don't listen to me. And then if you really want to get bizarre, and some mathematicians like to, you can go beyond this. So what's stopping us from just defining i? Why not add more? J's and K's, quaternions, are things that are like alpha plus beta i plus delta uh, j plus gamma k. It's got four components. Trust me, when I got to that part of number theory, I said, okay, I'm done. I don't want to do math with four components. But some people need to do that. And if you, as a computer scientist, say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step away from that too. Well, know that in, in uh, some areas of computer science, like computer graphics, quaternions show up and become an important component. So you might, you might close the textbook right now and have to crack it back open again uh, later on. And then say, you know, you're not, four components are not enough for you you want eight, well, you, you're living in the realm of octonians then, uh, eight components. And again, I have no idea why you might need an octonian. I've explored reasons why you might need a quaternion. I've never known a reason why you need an octonian. If you've needed an octonian for something, let me know. I'm curious to know what it is. I probably won't even know what it is. Um, but these are, again, other number systems out there in the, in the in number space, I guess, uh, beyond the rational numbers. But here I want to maybe pull us back in. This video was an exploration of number, different number systems and abstract algebra. I want to bring us all the way back down. We're computer scientists, we're not mathematicians, at least hope most of my audience is not. So I expect